Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Scott Crone is a Chicago native whose career in architecture began in 1991. In 2012, Scott founded Coda Management Group, and Coda manages a wide range of real estate, including single and multifamily homes, retail, commercial, warehouse, and self-storage, and multi-use flex athletic spaces. He is also the author of High Performance Homes, Navigating the Green Road to Your Dream Home, a book for homeowners seeking to incorporate green technology into their home. And more recently, Scott also founded a revolutionary storage business, The One Stop Self Storage. The One Stop brand is built upon the premise of providing the best in storage solutions contained in sustainable, renewable construction. Scott resides in Wilmette, Illinois, with his wife and three children. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, the pleasure's all mine. I mean, that's a lot, you know, reading through your bio. That's a that's a that's a lot of moving pieces. That's a lot of activity. They're saying three questions. There, there, there are three questions that every guest who comes on this show. Can you briefly tell us where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Well, I think first of all, it means I'm I'm old. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, where it started way back, I just graduated from college and I was getting my master's in architecture. And uh, we were, you know, we had to do a summer class in order to really qualify for the program. So I had like three weeks off between graduating from college and starting graduate school. Mm. So we're all just sitting around drawing from nine in the morning until five at night and then talking and, you know, what we want to pursue and stuff. And it was at that point I realized that developers are the ones that really control the architectural world and, um, you know, are, is where, you know, control is a big thing within the design build industry, because if you don't have, if you're always asking people to choose you, you don't have that control. Mm. And so I, I learned that early on that if you buy the property, if you own the property, then you control the rest of the process. And so I had a professor who was a developer, also an architect and a, and a builder. And um, I connected with him. I got to be his TA. And then I began working on multifamily developments that he was actually building. So he would take those projects and work on them in class and he selected mine and so uh, to work on. So that's how I got started in the uh, development and real estate world. Man, that's fantastic. That's a smart professor, by the way, to uh, u- utilize his students in class as, as, uh, as free labor. That's, um, that's fan- <laughs> but it's also fantastic, obviously, you know, for you guys coming in and going, oh, okay, you know, we get to work on, on not theoretical, but live projects. So he did get a lot of criticism for that because of the fact that, um, you know, he was using it to enhance it, you know, his product or his company. But the way I saw it, as much as he was using us, we were using him because we were getting real, real world life experience. And so, you know, I went into it with that mentality that, Hey, this is going to be something I want to do the rest of my life. And I want to make sure that I'm learning from the best. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's, I think one of the things we're missing right now in a lot of universities is that real world application. So, you know, that's, um, that's, that's very cool that you got to do that. Let's move forward. You know, how, what happened between architecture and then say 2012, when you said, Hey, we're going to start Coda management group. Well, the biggest thing that happened was that we hit our third, you know, major recession. So the first one, you know, we, you know, it was the internet. Um, um, first was fuel and inflation in 91. And then we had, 2001 come along with obviously that we had the dot-com crash and then we had the real estate market crash. So we had those four major catastrophic events within the economy. Obviously the biggest one being 08, 09 when everything just collapsed. And so at that point in time, you know, I was predominantly in the residential world, either multifamily or single family or mixed use. And that whole market dried up completely so that we had to pivot. We had to shift. We were doing a lot of design build for people as opposed to anything speculative. But, every, you know, the banking world was pushing everybody into multifamily. And I saw a huge cap compression. I saw a lot of competition because that's everything everybody was going after. There wasn't any other product that you could get financing for. And I had a client. I was doing uh, real estate coaching and consulting. And uh, one of my clients wanted to find had, wanted me to find them a distressed self-storage facility. And I couldn't do it. And that's what opened my eyes to the world that, hey, if we're in the biggest recession that you know we've seen since the Great Recession, then why is this product doing so well? And that's when I began investigating and discovering it. And so in 13, we bought our first self-storage uh, building. And it wasn't actually a building, a self-storage building at that time. We converted it into a self-storage building. That's fascinating. Um, you know, we've heard that. 
from a lot of people that self storage is recession resistant recession. I never like to use the word proof, but resistant. And so you're living, living proof that you, you, you walked it and saw it. You went to buy distressed assets and you couldn't find any. Yeah. It's um, I, I do term it recessionary resistant. I agree with you. I don't think anything is proof. There's always going to be something that um, does it, but when we went back and studied every major recession since 91, you know, we've, we've tracked it, we've monitored it. There's been a slight decrease in occupancy followed by a large increase in, in growth. Even now um, we're seeing all time high in terms of occupancy across the country. Mm, wow. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So you guys started doing uh, you were managing though. It says you were, you were doing a wide range of real estate, multifamily homes, retail, commercial warehouse. Was this stuff that you were managing for other owners or was this stuff you guys were buying and holding in house? We were holding it in house. Okay. So I've sold off on my multifamily. Um, we do have one flex warehouse space remaining, but the rest of our product right now is all self storage from an investment port from a point of view. That's fascinating. And, and is this because of the um, trend you saw in 08 and just kind of taking risk off the table? Or what, what has been the thinking in getting rid of everything except for self-storage? Absolutely. It's all about risk. Um, you know, if I, if I compare multifamily to, to self-storage, you know, we were doing 400 units. It was $100 million in, in cost and in, in revenue. And I'm sorry, in, in total gross sales. I can do 400 self-storage facilities for under $6 million. So if you, if you look at the comparison, there's a whole lot less risk for that much equivalent type of unit product, um, but there's a lot more flexibility. When we were doing the 400 units, we didn't have a whole lot of flexibility in the product type because you know, we had a condominium building that was approved. So you know, there's only so much flexibility that we can change within those walls. But with us, with self-storage, I can take a 10 by 10 and convert it with another 10 by 10 and make it a 10 by 20. I can make it a five by five. I can make it, you know, I, there's a lot of flexibility with one I can do there without having to go and get different municipal changes and stuff like that. Right. And yeah. I mean, you're, you're decreasing your, um, you know, uh, I guess governmental risk in the sense that you've got codes, you've got code enforcement, you got all these people coming in and telling you what to do in a condo building. I mean, does anybody really care if you take a 10 by 10 and do a 10 by 20? No, because all we're doing is removing an interior wall and sliding it over, but the lighting, the fire suppression, all that's exactly the same. So, you know, from a life safety point of view, it's, it's exactly the same. That's fantastic. So you've simplified your business model. You have taken risk off of the table. Talk to us maybe about the return side of things. Has that profile changed any? Because usually there's a correlation there. It's a lot more predictable because it's, it's a, a product that can be monitored, it can be tracked, there's uh, spending patterns, you know, within the population. And so we can, we can model it out, we know what our lease up velocity should be, we shot, we also know how much risk we're taking when we go into a product because of supply and demand, how much demand is in a community, you know, in a certain three mile radius, and how much supply is out there. And we can, um, we can analyze and mark it up in terms of what we think we can do there. So that model is a lot more predictable. When we were doing it with uh, apartments, it was sort of like the field of dreams, build it and they will come. You know, you just, you just couldn't really predict exactly how much someone was going to be willing to pay or, you know, what, how fast they were going to, to buy your product. But in self-storage, there's a very predictable model. That's interesting. I mean, usually there's, there's a, a stronger correlation like, hey, the less risk, the lower the return. But you're saying in, in this case, you've deleveraged, taken risk off the table, and yet at the same time have gained a lot of um, valuable benefits, maybe that you couldn't find in other asset classes. There is. Um, in addition to that, I mean, we're, we're adding cost segregation. We're doing opportunity zones. We've uh, sold off our cell towers, all those sorts of things in order to um, enhance the rate of returns. And, you know, while at the same time, as we talked about minimizing the risk, we're not totally removing risk. There's always risk within development. Um, you know, when we're, when we're building, there is the buildup time there, you know, we do have to do with municipalities in terms of get, getting government approvals, but what we're trying to do is reduce all those as much as we can so that we have as, you know, don't have to fight as many battles on too many fronts. We can focus on what we need to do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So everything you guys are doing from this point forward is ground up development. No, we're buying existing and then we're also converting those as well. So we're, we're looking to do value add either in our management. Now that we have our own company, one stop self storage, we opened up our own brand and we have facilities now in Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, in Toledo and Dayton. 
Uh, we're going to be building in Louisville, Kentucky, and then we also own one in Maine. And so we're look, we buy existing facilities as well, and then look to see if we can either improve them from a management point of view or expand them. When you say convert, what does that mean? We're buying like a, an underperforming commercial building and we're turning it into self-storage. So we're, we're gutting it, we're cleaning it all out, putting all new mechanicals, all new roofs, um, making sure the exterior fenestrations are all good. And then we're putting in lockers in the interiors. That's interesting. What type of buildings are you finding right now that are good candidates for that? Uh, empty warehouses or uh, office, commercial office spaces in downtown areas. Um, like for instance, our Dayton project, it's 90,000 square feet. It had been empty for 40 years. Um, they couldn't convert it into multifamily because they didn't have underground parking. The, the structural base did not work for parking. And so it just made it difficult to, and there was no space for on-site parking. And so when we went in there, um, self-storage was the only use that could be done without having to go through a zoning variation. So we turned the whole 90,000 square feet into self-storage. The, the city did make us dedicate a corner of the building um, for retail, like a coffee shop. Um, but we do have provisions that if we if it doesn't lease out in a year, then we can convert it back into self-storage. That's interesting. And what was that type of building before? I, maybe I missed that. It was a, a five-story concrete uh, structure with a brick facade. And it was originally a warehouse and it had been empty. You know, there's no power, there's no gas, there's no water to it. We, we had to restore it. But all around it, is exploding with like loft condominiums and new new uh, apartments and condominiums and townhomes all in the downtown Dayton area. Right, which is perfect. I mean, I would imagine that's just perfect for you know for storage to be that readily available right within the vicinity of all those things occurring. Well, we like to encourage those neighbors to build out their livable space as much as possible and, and minimize their closets. <laughs> I like that. Minimize <laughs> your closets. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. That uh, That's fantastic. Talk to us a little bit about your sustainable, renewable construction initiatives in the self-storage space. What does that mean? Well, we really began that when I started the company back in 1998, looking at ways in which we could make any building more sustainable. Uh, solar orientation to, you know, just construction techniques to all those sorts of things. But at that point in time, really true green programs were more costly than the payback return. So we're, right. we're always looking for ways in which we can enhance the performance of a building without necessarily adding dramatically to the increase the construction cost, because otherwise the rate of return doesn't do that. Sure. But in each of these buildings, you know, we're putting in, we're taking off the roof, we're putting in current insulation codes. So we're going from like maybe zero insulation on the roofing to close to R50. Um, but we're also doing reflective. So for instance, in the warmer climates, we're going with a reflective metal uh, color so that the, the, you know, you don't get the heat gain in the building, cut down on the heating load. We're looking at better, higher, higher efficiency furnaces and cooling units, but then also lights that are not only motion, but timer sensitive. So they're all turning off. And then as you walk through the building, they, they all go on. Um, so everything along those lines, and you know, we're closing up the window fenestration. So a lot of buildings lose heat either vertically or horizontally through the windows. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can enclose the building with foam insulation and make the envelope tighter, then we'll have a more sustainable product. And so, you know, people might say, well, it doesn't, you know, it's a storage building. You know, we're not trying to make it look like, you know, a, uh, Ritz Carlton, right? We're not trying to make it the most beautiful building. We're trying to make it the most efficient and best product for our clients. That's interesting. I mean, I would think that a lot of those um, insulation and, and, you know, tightening up the building itself would apply more to, you know, spaces that require, you know, refrigerated, not refrigerated, but, but heated and cooled spaces, you know, in self storage. A lot of storage doesn't have any of that. Like it's just, you know, whatever the temperature is, the temperature is. So how, how does that work? All of our conversions are climate controlled. Okay. So, the so they're all. For. Golly, I knew there was a better word for it. Climate <laughs> control. That's too early in the morning, man. <laughs> yeah. So like, for instance, our Louisville project, that is our biggest load. There's actually cooling, not heating. Hmm. Um, you know, the existing building that we bought was the people, the tenants could not use the upper floors during the summer because the heat gain was so hard. Wow. And so, you know, by changing the insulation, by putting on new roofing, by putting in cooling and then closing up the windows, um, a lot of the windows were already closed up, but they don't have any insulation on the back side of them. Um, so that, you know, still adds to the heat gain. So the more heat we can keep out, the better condition the building will be. And then our operating costs will be lower. 
Right, right. How do you, how do you take that those um, you know green and and sustainable initiatives and recoup that cost compared to the guy down the street that doesn't give a rip? Well, the first part is that we are buying where we buy the product. So we're buying these buildings between eleven and twelve dollars, thirteen dollars a square foot. So it's well below my replacement costs. The only money that I do put into it is still below what another new construction facility will cost. So we have a competitive advantage there. So the money that we can spend on the energy efficiencies is because we're getting it on the acquisitions. Got it. That makes that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I really, really like that. Let's talk a little bit maybe about, you know, just kind of rewinding the, the tape a little bit and saying, what are some things that you have feel like you have done right over the years that have allowed you guys to get where you are today? Well, I, I'm not going to say I'm perfect on this, and, and I'll explain why I'm not perfect on it. I sold my last apartment building, you know, now four years ago. I thought we were at the peak of the market, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, there's still cap compression going on there. But I have the ability to pay attention and monitor and see what's going on with the general economy and knowing how we need to pivot to adjust, to adjust risk in order not to get caught. And so those are the things that we've been doing. Um, I've done it a couple of times now throughout the career. I mean, in 08, 09, I sold off and we stopped buying. We stopped buying um, speculative uh, properties um, because I saw the market coming as a crash. And I actually got criticized by my competition for selling too low. And I was like, I'd rather be done. I'm happy with the profit that I took and I'm, you know, I'm cutting and moving on. And so, you know, we've been able to pivot quite a few times in order to stay, you know, and survive. And there's been a lot of people that weren't able to do that. And, you know, here we are started in 1998 and here we are in 2021 still continuing. What advice do you have to someone who may be looking to scale their portfolio today? And how do you feel that that would, you know, correlate to what you saw in 07, 08, 09? And what advice would you give to them? Well, just because you've done it once or twice, maybe even five or 10 times, um, doesn't mean that you know it all. And, you know, there's a difference between being lucky and being successful. Successful is longevity. That's one of the things that my mentor talked about. We were in, um, you know, he, he came to the United States when he was 16 with a couple hundred dollars in his wallet. And now he's owns major fortune 500 companies and he's the president of a university. So, you know, he always says anybody can be lucky once, but to be successful, you have to look at a long play. So, you know, don't get too high on your highs and don't get too low on your lows. Make sure that you really focus on what you're doing and always looking to ways to improve. In fact, they just opened up at his university, a $170 million complex, and they had John Maxwell speak there. And he talked about his cycle of success. And it was test, 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 and become good at failing, failing the test and understanding how to improve and, and, and getting closer to perfection during those failed tests and then reuse it and then grow from there and then repeat the cycle. And, um, you know, that's something that we always want to do is making sure that we're always growing and developing. So just because you've done it a couple of times, don't think that it will continue forever because no market lasts forever. Right, right. Yeah. Is there, uh, I mean, what about, you know, treading carefully in this, you know, in this economy and where we are here, what were they recording this September 28th, 2021? Uh, like what, what about people moving forward now? Would you say, you know, by cautiously, would you say, you know, I mean, what, what do you think? I, I always think by cautiously, you make your money on the buy. And I think a lot of it has to do depending on your market. I mean, that there are hot markets right now, no doubt about it. Um, you know, especially in, you know, Texas and Carolina and Tennessee, Arizona. I mean, those markets are continuing to explode, but there's other markets like here in Chicago, which are not. And, and so, you know, you need to know what's going on, but what are the drivers in that market that are causing that? and paying attention to those um, market drivers to see if they're going to be changing. If they begin to change, then you need to begin pivot your model. Right, right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And, 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 you know, I don't know what those early tell signs are when you see a market begin to change. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, one, I listened to what's going on in the federal government. Um, you know, with the first was the internet bust and then the real estate bust. 
um, the Fed was predicting it. You know, what is the Fed saying about the general economy in the market and then relaying it to what's going on locally? Mm. Um, then I also look at the local, you know, political situation in terms of taxes and structures and those sorts of things. And are municipalities being receptive to um, building or are they being, you know, negative pressure on things? Um, you know, we go into a, a community and they're like, well, you can, we can have self-storage anywhere but here. We don't want it here. You know, that's a telltale sign that, okay, you know, something is driving that, you know, usually the worse the economy, the more receptive municipalities are because they, they're trying to spur their economy, their local economy, right? And if the economy is booming, then they could give a flip. They think they have all the power in the world and they don't need you. At that point in time, they don't. So you have to be, you know, seeing what's going on at those levels in terms of getting your zoning, your entitlements, and um, also what's going on in the financing world. Are, are things tightening up? Are you seeing, you know, interest rates rising in terms of lenders? Are you seeing, you know, you have to put more money down? What is driving that? And usually that is banks minimizing their risk. They're looking at their risk portfolio. And so, you know, I'm, I'm reading the papers. I'm, I'm paying attention to what's going on in the news. I'm looking nationally. I'm looking locally. And then I'm also getting feedback constantly from lenders and brokers to say, okay, what, what are the trends that we're seeing here? So I'd say I spend at least 20% of my day listening to what other people say and, um, you know, just absorbing. And that's one of the things my mentor just talked about as recently as yesterday. There's a difference between listening and hearing. You know, we use our ears to hear, but we need to use our minds to listen and just paying attention to what's going on in the world. Someone in your position, you would think, you know, has done so much and accomplished so much that at this point, mentors or a mentorship would not be necessary um, or, or valuable. Why do you still have a mentor in your life and what do they do? Well, there's plenty of areas that I need to work in my life. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not being facetious when I say that. And, um, you know, uh, a mentor or a life coach, a, a spiritual director or whatever you want to call them, they, you know, shine light in areas that you're gotten used to covering up and exposing. And so in, in those areas, um, we can all work to be better um, and grow. I mean, ultimately, that's what I think it is. I think God put us here to learn more about ourselves and more about him and, you know, just to, to grow. So if, if not, we're in relationship with other people. And so how we, how we interact with, with other people is what it's about. Man, that's great. Scott, I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, there's been so much we've covered today. I, gosh, I got a hundred more questions. We're out of time. <laughs> My Any, pleasure. I'm glad we could do this. Absolutely. Anything else to add uh, before we jump into the final four questions? Well, Sam, I, I, want, I really wanted to thank you for having us. And, and if someone is interested more in learning about self-storage, um, as a gift to your listeners, if they mention this show, we will send them a free feasibility study report that we buy for our properties. And so I will give them one that we've done so they could see why we went into that market, why we made those decisions. And so we will, we will email that to them for free if, if they mention the show. Man, that's awesome. And if you are listening, that's, that's a valuable gift. Thank you, Scott, because I think uh, once you read through a, a good feasibility report, you'll, it'll really shine a lot of light uh, on how it kind of engineers and, and helps Scott and his team think. So that's a, that's a really valuable gift. Thank you, Scott. Final four questions are this. First one, if I gave you just 20000 bucks to invest in real estate and you had no previous real estate investing experience, what would you do with it and why? Well, I would try to take as much advantage as of the local tax structures. So for me, when I had $20,000, I began buying smaller uh, residential things, fixing them up, seeing appreciation, and then after living in it for two years, flipping it tax-free, and then continuing to do that. So my wife and I, we did that six times, and we went from a $92,000 condominium up into our current home, which we you know, put a little bit more than $92,000 into it. <laughs> That's awesome. Six times. That that's serious dedication to a process. I've known I've known people who've done it a few times, but six every that means for twelve years years you're implementing the same exact process. It was the same concept, not the same process, because we went from condo to another condo, and then we bought a house where we put a second story on it. Then we bought a property where we tore it down and built a new one. Then we the next one we tore it down a house and built a new one, and then the last final one we tore down another house and built a new one. That's awesome. I love that. Question number two is this, if you could help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be and how would you avoid it? Making sure you do your due diligence and not overpaying for a property. I mean, during the, the last crash of 809, I saw people pine for, I'm sorry, buying for over asking price 
And then they got stuck holding properties that they couldn't move. And it just, it just wipes you out. You know, you have to be able to move a property and the, your cost basis is the critical thing to that. Right, man. That's fantastic. Question number three, when it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Oh, well, I'm investing in myself and hopefully, you know, I can make my little world a better place. And so I, I began a two-year program of um, called transformation. And so every quarter we meet and um, it's like a retreat and a lot of it involves solitude and silence. And um, so that is something that I'm doing to improve my leadership skills, improve my company and also, you know, those that are around me. Man, that's great. I love that. Scott, if our listeners want to get in touch with you or your team, what is the best way to do that? Well, you, you saved the hardest for last here. So <laughs> um, our webpage is www.coda, C-O-D-A-M as in management and G as in group.com. So codamg.com. And you can email us at info at codamg.com. You can also check out our website, One Stop Self Storage. That's all spelled out with letters. Um, dot com, one stop self storage dot com. Scott, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.